Really good question. Um, let me give one comparison. I mean, I wouldn't take this necessarily as a model for future government or something like that, but May, June, I spent a couple of weeks in Italy. Um, every day after uh, breakfast, I would sit in the garden of my hotel and I would open the Milan newspaper and there are two or three pages, whole pages, of articles on cultural analysis, the art of Giotto, Fellini's filmmaking, um, Holocaust survivor, Italian Holocaust survivors that Primo leave in, so I'm writing about experiences and analyses of these things in such a way that these types of articles could only appear in the United States in specialized academic journals. If the Washington Post attempted to do that on a daily basis, it would be broke in a month. You know it and I know it. Nobody would buy the paper anymore. In Milan, it's been going on for decades. There is actually an intelligent, literary middle class that reads such as there was in the United States between roughly 1900 and 1960 or 65. You know, that has disappeared here. We only have a mass culture. We don't have a, a culture that buys Somerset Maugham, Graham Greene, and you know, they're, they're not happening in it anymore. Ask the folks at Olson's what's selling. You know, it's going to be New Age and it's going to be self-help manuals and stuff like. That. It's not going to be Graham Greene. Okay, um, so we're we're in a, in a situation now. You know, I mean, as far as using Italy as a model, uh, I don't know, I kind of have to admire a country that votes out its government every nine months. You know, there's something neat about that. I, I kind of like anarchy, you know. Um, there's something just wonderful about that in a certain way. At the same time, you know, I mean, I was aware of the fact that the lira wasn't very stable. A dollar was buying 2,000 lira at the time, which is, boy, not good for the Italians. You know, great for me, but, you know, to live there is a different story. And so it's, you know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, as somebody, somebody had earlier said, what are the repercussions outside our borders? And certainly the European countries are going to be affected by any downturn that we're involved in. But to travel around those countries, I have to tell you that when I got on the plane to the return to the United States, I wept. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, for example, the United States is a country that has substituted comfort for aesthetics. It happens all the time, and the result is the environment's kind of ugly. Walking around Italy is like, huh, to die for. It's in, whether you're in the countryside or you're in the cities, aesthetically, this is so fabulous. Why can't we do that? Because we don't give a damn about that stuff. That's why. Yeah. What about the role of newspapers? I, I'm thinking in particular of the Washington Post. That we lived overseas for a number of years. We come back to the States, we go overseas, we come back. And it seems every time I come back, the Washington Post is a worse newspaper. It's just getting dumber and dumber. <laughs> to the point where it's hard to find a story that reads like a news story anymore. They start off with little tales of someone sitting on a bench somewhere in a park or something. You have to get to page three before you find out what the story, what the news is. Yeah. And you contrast that with Canada, just north of us, the Toronto Globe and Mail still reads like an excellent newspaper. Yeah. Newspapers yeah. used to be in the 1950s right. in the United States. Right. Is the Washington Post deliberately, I, mean, I, I suppose not deliberately, but leading the decline, do you think? Or is yeah, it leading the decline, but they're responding to the fact that if they don't dumb down, they won't sell. But on the other hand, they're certainly in danger of losing me. I mean, I'm much more, much I less likely to, to buy the newspaper than I used to be. I have to tell you something, be. sir. There are much more of the people that don't know who the president of the United States are than there are of you. Okay? You are not in the majority. Uh, in 1956, Adlai Stevenson, uh, running uh, for uh, election against Ike, uh, was at Vassar. And after he finished talking, one woman, a student at Vassar, stood up and said, Governor Stevenson, you have every thinking person's vote. And Adlai shot back, won't work, I need a majority. <laughs> now he would have to say, won't work, I need 10%. You know, you are not in the majority. Well, how, do you have, do you have an, excuse me, if you don't go ahead. following up. No, go ahead. Do you have an explanation for why Canada seems to somehow be doing differently? That educational system, you know, I taught for seven and a half years in Canada. I taught for two years in Concordia, uh, in Montreal, and then... Uh, uh, I taught at the University of Victoria in British Columbia for five and a half years. Um, and as far as I could determine, I mean, things, this was a long time ago and things may have changed. But as far as I could determine, um, it's a system that at least has some allegiance or derivation from an English, a British system, 
which has higher standards. And in that sense, you know, there's a greater emphasis on education. Uh, so it's not like I found, I can't say that I found Canadian students, that we're talking just on an undergraduate across the board sort of level, I can't say that I found Canadian students dramatically better than American students, but somehow the requirements, what was understood to be required, seemed at a bit higher level. Whether that's still true or not today, I really don't know. As far as newspapers go, I, I certainly agree with you about the Globe and Mail. It's really readable. It's, it's really high class. And actually, it compares in some ways with the Wall Street Journal, which remains a very good newspaper. Very good newspaper. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. We'd have to talk about figures of circulation and things like that, and who's reading the Globe and Mail. It is the, the national Canadian newspaper. It's sold in Vancouver as well as Toronto or Montreal. But at the same time, most of the sales in Vancouver are the Vancouver Sun or the province, not the Globe and Mail. So I, I don't know how to make a judgment about that. Really. Somebody in the back had a question. Yeah. Um, I was just, I came in a little bit late, but um, I was curious from uh, the early parts of what I heard, there seemed to be a great deal of idealization of of the past, uh, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, how intellectual life was um, was so dramatically better than it is today, mm -hmm. and uh, and life just seemed to be a great deal better. And I, I really wonder if you look at uh, even this country or the globe as a whole, whether you can honestly say that we're worse off today than we've ever been, uh, mm -hmm. just with, with no uh, great ideological opponent. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, there's certainly trouble, but is the trouble as bad as it as it has ever been? And materially, at least, it's I think virtually impossible to argue that there's been a better time in the history of humanity. Uh, oh, I I would say there have been many better times in the history of humanity. It isn't the case that as you go further and down the chronological line, that life has gotten better. There have been many cases of happier civilizations and so on. I mean, the United States, is, it's not, it's not, this is not progress. Um, progress has to have more things in it than the number of toys we have in our environment. But you did miss the beginning, and what I was talking about was inequalities of wealth. You talk about prosperity. Um, what we've got is a situation now, worse than at any time in American history, of differential of a rich and poor. 1% of the American population owns 47% of the wealth in this country. There are more of them, and they're below the poverty line. It's gotten larger and larger. So although you could... Because there's more immigrants, though. Are there, are there factors that you can call into question to say that this is why there's more? Because we've got a million immigrants coming in every year that are largely unskilled. Is Yeah, that, I mean, right, that may be the case. That may be the case. But the, the question is, if we're talking about quality of life, what do we have here, you know? If people say to me, um, well, you know, I mean, maybe people didn't even read at all previously or, or you know, something like that, uh, my answer to that is at least um, the, the tradition was, there was a vibrant middle class that did, and at least that was the ideal. When you're saying, well, we're, gonna, we're letting more immigrants in, my response is, what are we letting them in to, you know? Um, that's that's the issue I think that we have to talk about. Somebody over here, though. yeah. Other people probably aware of this too. Average uh, real in real terms uh, wages have actually declined, uh, which is indicative of this of the split between uh, uh, the wealthy and uh, forget the poor, just the not you know the average mm -hmm. American. Uh, the real yeah. wages have actually declined, so. It's not so much uh, an influx of uh, an influx of immigrants or, or or other criteria. This is just data from 1985, yeah. and it wouldn't be it wouldn't have been large enough to actually affect you know the real wage of the average American worker as much if this if this uh, disparity had been. Broken. Yeah, and it, you know as far as thank you, and as far as rates of literacy goes, I mean Lawrence Stone, the great American historian who died last year, did a study of history of literacy in the United States and demonstrated that we were more literate as a whole. The nation was more literate as a whole in the 17th century than it is today. You know, I mean, it's, it's cannot, I don't think it can't, can be argued that we're in our best period. I think that would be a tough one. So, anything else? Thank you.
Thank you again for coming. Uh, books are available on the table. We do have, uh, again, a few copies of Coming to Our Senses and uh, quite a few of The Twilight of American Culture. Cashiers are uh, on my left. Thank you so much for attending. Morris Berman is a cultural historian and social critic. He teaches in the Master of Liberal Arts program at Johns Hopkins University. His previous books include Wandering God and Reenchantment of the World. His new book, The Twilight of American Culture, is published by W.W. W. Norton and Company. Forty-eight hours of non-fiction books on TV. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Next, Cindy Small tells the life story of Jenny Waite, the only civilian casualty at the Battle of Gettysburg. After that, on children's books, a panel of book industry executives and editors discuss the ideal book for children. Tonight on Biography on Book TV, John Culver talks about Henry Wallace, a prominent and controversial figure in President Roosevelt's New Deal. Then Jonetta Rose Barris discusses the impact of fatherlessness on black women. Her book is called Whatever Happened to Daddy's Little Girl. Later, Luang Ung, author of First They Killed My Father, shares her family's experiences under Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia. Tomorrow, C-SPAN takes you to the Harlem Book Fair. Beginning at noon Eastern, we'll walk the streets of Harlem for conversations with authors, vendors, and readers. Then we'll sit in on a discussion about black literature with writers Bell Hooks, Omar Tyree, Colin Channer, and Lionel Bascom. Tomorrow at noon Eastern, here on Book TV. What are you reading these days? Well, right now I'm reading a uh, history of Lewis and Clark and their journals uh, about their exploration in the early 1800s. And I'm interested in that because uh, it was the first uh, really uh, description of the West from the European point of view. Uh, I have grew up in New Mexico. I plan to retire back out there. I do a lot of uh, research in that area, uh, and so I'm really interested in it. What do you like about their writing? Well, it's it's very original. I mean, these were journals that these these two men wrote each evening into campfire after they had uh, finished their travel that day. So it's uh, fresh in their mind. They were the first white men, if you will, to see that part of the West. And uh, so their observations are, they weren't thinking about uh, what the people back home might think. They were actually putting down what they saw. And that was, that's very refreshing. Well, virtually anything by Patrick O'Brien, especially the Jack Aubrey, uh, Stephen Maturin novels, they're, they're excellent. As sea stories go, they're fine. And as novels, they're also fine. As good as anything that anybody's written about the sea. What do you like about his writing? I like the, uh, the settings, I like the way he sets it with complete details. You feel that you're there. That's the thing I like about it. I recently, re recently read Fathering Words, a book about a man's relationship with his father who was an immigrant from the Virgin Islands and about how he grew up in the Bronx, then moved to Washington, D.C. and became a poet. How did you come across it and what do you like about it? Um, it was recommended by another father to me um, who thought it was taught him a lot about how to raise his children and just think about growing up. What's a good book that you've read? Uh, Gone for Soldiers by Jeff Sherrill. Terrific book. Just finished it. Loved it. What kind of book is it and why do you like it? It's a, uh, it's a story of the Mexican War and I like it because basically I like the, um, the author, Jeff Sherrill. He's a terrific author. And I got into this because I'm going backwards from the Civil War, so back to the Mexican War. Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Join us for a look at the world of nonfiction books and the publishing industry, Saturday morning at 8 through Monday morning at 8 Eastern. 48 hours of nonfiction books, all weekend, every weekend, on Book TV. Now, from Greystone's American History Store in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Cindy Small discusses her book, The Jenny Wade Story. Jenny Wade was the only civilian casualty at the Battle of Gettysburg. This program lasts a half an hour. You are at Greystone's American History Store, History Books 2000. And we are continuing with our talks.